Not So we're going to start today, and I'm not going to say this is genetics, even though it kind of is, because sometimes you hear genetics and you kind of freak out because it sounds real sciencey. But we're talking about inheritance. You don't look exactly like your mom. You don't look exactly like your dad. You're a blend. You have inherited traits from them. And we've already talked about various health problems we have that are inherited. So some of the things you get from your parents is good, and some of the things you get are not so good. But really, our whole beginning of understanding of inheritance starts with a monk. And you would think, a monk. Don't monks have to chant and read their religious texts? Well, in his spare time, he was a naturalist. And this is Gregor Mendel. And he spent his time in the garden looking at pea plants. Now, you must think, what a boring life that must have been just to look at pea plants. But he was curious why some of the plants were tall and some short, why some had certain color flowers and some had wrinkled peas versus smooth. How did those traits get passed from parent to offspring? And so he started this whole process of inheritance. And it's basically from his rudimentary understanding and this was centuries ago he didn't have DNA isolation kits, he didn't have microscopes he was just observing and using statistics to try to understand how this happened but we call this Mendelian genetics and it is still accepted today as how inheritance actually occurs now we're going to expand on Mendel's idea of genetics and put more detail with it including the fact that in the human body, every cell that we have, with the exception of the sperm in males and the egg in females, all of our somatic cells have 22 pair of chromosomes, and these are going to be the same whether they're you're male or female. And so we call them autosomes. And the final pair that we have are the sex chromosomes either XX in female or XY in male. Now, I want to point out, just because we say that these chromosomes are the same, I want you to understand that they have the same genes, meaning these chromosomes are going to have the genes for eye color, for hair color, for attached earlobe or detached earlobe. But you can have different flavors of those genes because we have brown hair, blonde hair, black hair, red hair, so the genes themselves are going to be the same in the autosomes, even though we may have completely different flavors. Now the illustration that you see at the bottom, this is showing our 22 autosomes as they may be identified in cells. And then you can see that the XX pair is distinctly different from what we see in the XY pair. The Y chromosome has so few genes actually on it. But it's important that we have that Y chromosome because the default pathway for gender development in the human species is female. If no signals are sent, then that fertilized egg is going to end up being a female individual. The genes on the Y chromosome not only have to turn on the male genes, but they also at the same time have to turn off the female genes so that the resulting individual will be, will be male. So that's why there's just hardly anything. And I think you can appreciate, did we talk earlier about the ability to go to a fertility clinic and tell them you want either a, a, a girl or a boy? You can see that X chromosome is going to be a lot heavier than that little bitty inky dinky Y. So just with centrifugation, you can separate them out, recover them and do artificial insemination and be 100% accurate in the resulting baby. So just a refresher. Remember we talked about mitosis, meiosis. Do you remember that from, was it unit one or unit two? We talked about that. <coughs> so we're just going to be a little bit of a reminder here. 
that this chromosome that is one DNA molecule and all the attached proteins, those histone proteins that help it coil up, versus when we're in the middle of interphase, we are going to make copies of that chromosome and they're still going to be attached together. And when we see this duplicated pair attached together, they're sister chromatids. Now let's see if I can take anybody back. This is not going to be on the test. Don't freak out. But at what stage of interphase are you going to replicate your DNA? I'm using replicate because it's not the word that's going to be that one letter of that phase. Because you remember in interphase we had G1, we had G2, and there was something stuck right in the middle where we replicate our DNA. I, th I think I heard the sound. What would be another word for replication or producing something? Scientific word. Oh, it's, you, got, you got the S part right. Synthesis. So it's the S phase of interphase where we are going to produce those sister chromatids and they're still going to remain attached together. Now, this is another instance in which we're going to have our 23 pair of chromosomes. And each one of those 23 pair is going to be replicated. Remember, you're going to have a chromosome 1 from mom and a chromosome 1 from dad. And when we get into meiosis, where we're going to produce either a sperm or an egg, we are going to have these homologous chromosomes lined up along the equator, and they're going to have to be separated. So do we understand the homologous chromosome? The two copies of chromosome 1, the two copies of chromosome 2. If we're talking about a chromosome 1 and a chromosome 10, those are not homologous. What does homo mean? The same. Do you see, do you see how we get homologous? The same. The same set of genes. They've colored these differently because this is the chromosome number one you got from mom, and that's the chromosome number one you got from dad. So they have the same blood type, eye color, hair color, genes, even though the blood type trait you may get from dad might be B versus the blood type trait you got from mom is A. Does that make sense? So this, this is where we're going to, conv I've been using genes and traits, so I'm, I'm glad we got this here. Because it's important to know the distinction. A gene is a, a unit of information for a specific trait. Hair color, eye color, blood type. And the locus is where exactly that gene is located on the chromosome. But the different forms of the genes we call alleles. So what would be some alleles for hair color? What would be some alleles for hair color? Blonde, brown, black, red. What would be alleles for blood type? A, B, O. Those are our three alleles, A, B, and O. But then we also have another gene that's going to give us other blood type alleles. What would that be? Negative or positive. That's the RH gene. The RH gene would have two alleles, either a positive or a negative. See how that works? So in our illustration, we can see, we'll just go ahead and call these homologous chromosomes. We'll say the blue is from dad and the sort of lavender is from mom. The different color and the different positions here, that's a locus, a location on each one of these homologous chromosomes. And so you can see they're in the same place. And if we're looking at the genes for eye color, hair color, height, earlobes, you can see those genes are in the same place. But some of these have slightly different colors. This is not exactly the same green. That's not exactly the same orange. So this is showing a difference in the alleles for those particular genes. Now, we call these, what kind of chromosomes, if they're both number ones? Homologous. Homologous chromosome. 
Here comes a term that's similar. But now we're going to talk about traits on each one of our homologous chromosomes that have the same allele. Let's do blood type. Who has O-type blood? Didn't we have someone with O-type blood in here? Yeah, you got an O-type blood. So you got an allele for O-type blood from dad, and you got an allele of O-type blood from mom. Those are the same, identical alleles. So we say your genes or your alleles for blood type are homozygous. Again, homo meaning the same. Guess what it's going to be if the alleles are different? What do you think? Heterozygous. Heterozygous. So um, who has AB? Any AB blood? Blood types in here? Maybe AB blood? If you're AB blood, we absolutely know you're heterozygous because you've got an A from one parent and a B from another parent. If you have A-type blood or if you have B-type blood, you could either be homozygous or heterozygous because you could either have two A's or you could have an A and an O because we don't say people have AO-type blood, right? We just say the A-type. So for those individuals, you could be either homozygous or heterozygous. Now, in the case of blood type, we don't have this sort of dominant situation because you can express A, you can express B, and they are expressed at the same time. But in some situations, you have a dominant versus a recessive allele. And we can look at our RH factor for that case. RH plus basically is considered dominant. And I'm, I'm using that very loosely as an example. Because for our RH factor, you could have a positive and a positive allele, homozygous, your RH positive. But if you have a positive and a negative, is that still homozygous? No, it's heterozygous. And what is your blood type going to be if you have a positive and a negative? It's going to be positive. Because that positive being present, that's what dictates the actual trait. So we're going to have some genes that the expression of one of these positive dominant genes is enough for you to manifest that physical trait. Great example is color blindness. You remember we had color blindness? Did you ever get that checked out any further? <laughs> so that is a dominant situation. We didn't have any girls that were, I'm sorry, females that are colorblind, did we? That's on the X chromosome. So for females to be colorblind, you would have to have these two colorblind recessive genes present. But for guys, since we only have one X chromosome, it only takes one to be expressed there. Now, if a guy has a dad that is colorblind. Let's think about it. It's kind of a logic problem. If you had a dad that was colorblind, does that mean you are absolutely going to be colorblind? No. Why? Now you got your Y chromosome from dad, otherwise we'd be calling you some girly name, right? Because you'd have two X chromosomes. It has to be from mom. Was your mom colorblind? You probably would know if she was colorblind, right? then probably she's not. So, in your mom's case, she is going to be heterozygous. She has a colorblind gene, but she also has a normal vision gene, and that normal vision gene is dominant. It doesn't allow the colorblind gene to be expressed. Just in the lottery that was you getting her egg, flipped a coin, 50-50 shot, right? You lost. You got, you got the colorblind gene. So does that make sense, how the dominant versus recessive works? Both alleles have to be recessive if you're going to express that recessive trait, if it's on one of the autosomes or on the X chromosome for females. But it only takes one dominant to overshadow whatever the other one might do. Do you have brothers or sisters or any of, any of those? Well, they won that lottery because they got mom's good vision gene for color. <coughs> 
So once again, there's just our example of just our, our heterozygous condition. And if the little A's here are, would be colorblind, and the big A's are normal vision, what would this individual be? Normal vision. Because there's that one dominant that overshadows the recessive trait. So when we talk about alleles, we're actually talking about a piece of genetic information, the, the chromosomes on our homologous pairs. And so the alleles that we have, we refer to them as the genotype for a particular individual. And this is somewhat how we can determine what our genotype is, like for blood type, for instance. How we can know with our blood type, are we AA or are we AO? Now again, O type blood, you're OO, you have to be. AB blood, you're AB. Your phenotype and your genotype are the same thing. But for A type blood and B type blood, we would have to do some genetics knowing what our parents' blood types are to then be able to figure out what are our two alleles that we have for blood type. Now certainly our genotypes, our two alleles, are going to determine what our phenotype is. And I like that PH in the front because phenotype is the physical manifestation of your genes. And so genotype, for instance, you may have a dominant or recessive. Here is our detached earlobe. There's our attached earlobe. I think this is recessive and that's dominant. I may have that backwards. But then we also have the tongue curling, which we've already talked about. That, that is a, a genetic feature. You see dad and daughter, they're able to curl their tongue. Poor mom, she can't curl her tongue. So do we get genotype and phenotype? So far we're doing a lot of definitions, and, and maybe you're familiar with some of these already. Okay, now, now this, we've talked about this a little bit, but these are some of Mendel's observations and, and Mendel's laws that we have modified and sort of improved upon. But we've got two of these laws. One of these laws we're going to call segregation. And segregation says these homologous chromosomes that we talk about, they are going to move independently of one another. And as they move these homologous chromosomes, they're going to be segregated into our gamete cells. And remember, that's a big fancy word for either sperm or egg. Gamete is a generic sex cell terminology. But you're only going to get one each. See, here are our homologous chromosomes. Mom's on one side, dad's on another side. Why they made them the same color necessarily, I don't know. I wish they had made them different colors. But you're going to go through meiosis and you're going to form your sister chromatids, still attached at the centromere. Our first round of meiosis, we're going to segregate the homologous pairs into different daughter cells. And then in the second round of meiosis, we are going to separate those sister chromatids so that we have four germ cells, sperm or egg, that are each going to have one copy. And even though they're the homologous chromosomes, those alleles don't have to be the same. So segregation is one. That's important. Daughter cells are going to get one copy of each chromosome. In this principle of independent assortment, this is the one where we start to look at just random chance and uh, statistics. But our homologous chromosomes and our sister chromatid pairs, they're going to move regardless of what's going to happen to any of the other homologous chromosomes. So this gives you an idea, sort of the random chance thing that can occur. Here we have, uh, we'll, we'll say this is a germ cell that's getting ready to produce four sperm. So when we go through and we look at our homologous pair for chromosome 1, and we'll say this is a homologous pair for chromosome 20, we're going to see that our blue chromosomes from dad, blue chromosomes from mom, you could end up with a case where you have two, uh, two sperm 
that have both of those representatives from dad. And then the other two sperm are going to have both of those representatives from mom. That's one way it could happen. But it could also very easily happen where you get chromosome 1 from dad and chromosome 1, uh, 2, uh, what did I call it, 20, from mom. And then two more where you get chromosome 1 from mom and chromosome 20 from dad. What chromosome 1 is doing has no impact whatsoever on what chromosome 20 is doing. And again, it's lottery. It's the random chance of which chromosome is going to be segregated into which daughter cell. And you're going to do that 23 times. For chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3. It's all happening at the same time, but each movement is going to be completely 50-50 shot. And there's that whatever. Can I burn it with the laser? No. All right. So here's, here's what Mendel did, and we're going to start off looking at one physical trait, one phenotype which Mendel called a monohybrid cross, mono meaning one. And Mendel used this little graphical model he called a Punit square. Some people call it Punit square. I've always heard it Punit square. Either way, Punit, Punit. And it's going to look like this. We're going to have a box, and for a monohybrid cross, we're going to say that for a single trait, blood type, for instance, for our sperm, your blood type can either be an A, and let's go ahead and make this little A, let's say that's an O. If you want to write that in your notes, maybe to make it a little easier, go ahead and do that. So we're going to have a dad that has A-type blood, but his two alleles are A or O. Mom is also going to have the same blood type. She's A-type blood, so she has an A and she has an O. So what, is, what are the chances of the children of this couple all having A-type blood? And that's what you look at and you do the Punit square method. So we're going to look in this square. Here we get our A-type blood from mom. It's going to be put in these two squares. And we get our O-type from mom. We'll put in these two squares. But then we take the A type from dad and put in these two going across. And we take the O type from mom and put it in those two going across. So here's the trick question. What percent of the offspring of these two couples are going to be homozygous? What percent of the offspring from these two couple are going to be homozygous? 50%. Because you can either be homozygous A or you can be homozygous O. What percent are heterozygous? Well, duh, 50%. If 50% if are homozygous, the other 50 have to be heterozygous. And that's the difference in the alleles. Now, with the little A being O type blood, what are the chances now? Looking at this. What are the chances of having a child with A-type blood? 75%. Does everybody see that? Because you can have A-type blood if you're homozygous A. You have A-type blood if you're heterozygous. The only way or the only percent you're going to have of having a child with O-type blood is this one-fourth or 25% down at the bottom. And you, you can do this whether we're talking about homozygous dominance, homozygous recessive. Now, if you've got homozygous dominant, homozygous dominant, what are the chances of having a homozygous dominant offspring? 100%. So this is a way that you can determine what are the chances of having a child with a certain genotype or a child with a certain phenotype. So let's see what we do here. We've got an experiment. We're going to do a red-blue monohybrid cross. And how I invented this, I don't even remember. We're going to take a blue-haired person. I think when I first did this, people weren't dying their hair blue. But we see blue-haired people today. But we're thinking it's genetic now, right? 
we're going to take a blue-haired person with a red-haired person. All right? So if we have 5,000 cases, if these two individuals have 5,000 children, and the offspring, which are going to be the family one, that's what that means, the offspring of our parents. The parents are P1, this is F1. If all of the children have blue hair, what might you infer about the blue hair trait versus the red hair trait? Which is dominant? Blue, blue is dominant. Absolutely, we know blue is dominant. And so if every single one of these is blue, what else probably can you get a pretty good idea about, about the genotype of our dominant blue-haired individual? If we're going to have a blue trait showing up, we're going to have to have at least one dominant gene, right? And if they're all blue, what do you think the genotype is for our blue individual, huh? Homozygous dominant, right? So, kind of working through this. Pretty much figure, yeah, we're, we're going to be homozygous. If red is recessive, then we can pretty much figure that, okay, we're going to have a homozygous recessive if we're expressing that red over the dominant blue color. 100% of our offspring have blue hair. What will the genotype of every single one of those offspring be? I think I heard somebody say, hmm? Big, P, little, big B, little R, what do we call that? Homozygous? Heterozygous. So our genotype is 100% blue hair color, 100% heterozygous. Now, if we then, as Mendel did, if Mendel took the two of these heterozygous individuals from that F1 generation and crossed them, because Mendel saw all this, and he's like, well, where did all the red trait go? Did we lose the red trait? But now if we cross these, what percentage of our offspring are going to have blue hair? 75%. How many with red hair? 25%. Because we're only ever going to see red hair with what genotype? The two little R's. That's only going to happen 25% of the time. And we'll have red hair. Now that's statistics, right? That's statistics. So statistically speaking... When you have your first child, ladies, guys, when you father your first child, what are the odds of you having a boy versus a girl? Hmm? 50-50. If you have 20 girls, and you're, I'm going to say baby mama, because there's, I don't think there's any lady going to have 20 kids, and there won't another one. But if you father 20 female children and your baby mama gets pregnant again, what are the chances of you having a boy versus a girl? 50-50. It's 50-50 every single time. Every time there's a pregnancy, there's a 50-50 chance. Now, that's just statistically speaking. There's, there's some evidence that the female reproductive tract, depending upon the pH, depending upon the, the time and the cycle, depending on when intercourse happened, closer or further away from ovulation, maybe has an impact on Y versus X carrying sperm. Because which sperm are going to go faster? The X sperm or the Y sperm? Which truck is going to drive faster? A truck with a fully loaded bed or a truck with an empty bed? Yeah, it, you don't have a, yeah, the Y chromosome's a little bitty. So those sperm are going to go faster. So there's some suggestion that if intercourse happens 
24 hours before ovulation, all the sperm are going to be at the egg at the same time because the male sperm are going to be waiting and the female sperm are going to catch up just because they've got a heavier load to carry. Ladies, do you all ever feel like you always have a heavier load to carry? Well, maybe that's because it starts out that way in sperm. But if you have intercourse just a few hours before ovulation occurs, there's some evidence to say that the Y sperm will get there first and the chances of having a male will increase. I don't know. I don't know that that's scientifically proven, but it sort of makes logical sense. But if you just look at the numbers and you just look at the, at the alleles, it's a 50-50 shot. So, in some instances, like our earlobes, like color blindness, that's a dominant versus recessive. But in some cases, we can have an incomplete dominance. So that if we have a situation where we have, and, and this is a case of horses, if you have a fairly dark brown horse that is chestnut, purebred chestnut horse, and we have a horse that is almost completely white, which is a recessive. When you look at the offspring that are all going to be heterozygous, one big C, one little C, we don't have 100% horses that are chestnut in color. It's a color that's kind of in between. So you get some of the brown, you get some of the white, and you end up with this spotted horse that in some places on the horse, you've got the dark patches, in some places the light patches. You ever seen a Palomino? That's incomplete dominance. So there's our nice, beautiful chestnut horse. There's a beautiful white horse. I'm not sure which is the stallion or not. But then the Palomino, oh, I'm thinking of something else. I'm sorry. This is just, I call this a blonde horse, but that's a Palomino. What's the one that's got the spots? Paint, I'm sorry, I was confusing with the paint. But that's the Palomino that's more of the blonde color, halfway between the brown and the white. So do you, you see how that, it's like blending colors on a computer. Now our blood types are codominant. And with codominance meaning each allele is going to be expressed. So in the case of our, our blood types, Again, if you're A, your genotype's either going to be AA or A. And I hate sort of how they drew this here, sort of as an empty box. But what they're trying to illustrate is in your blood types, you have these same proteins on all of your red blood cells. And depending on what sugar is placed on that protein will dictate your blood type. If you have a certain sugar, then they're going to call it A. If you don't have any sugars, they call that O type. And so literally for this individual, you have some of these proteins that have the A sugar and some of these proteins that have no sugar at all. And so the only blood type you see there is going to be A. With O, you can only get that when you just have two of the proteins but none of the sugars. But this is the one I want you to really look at. This is a really great example of codominance. Because if you have an A allele and a B allele, what is your blood type? A, B. It, it's both expressed equally on the surface of all your red blood cells. And that's the best example of codominance. Now, we, we've been talking so far about a monohybrid cross, and we've been talking about blue versus red, or in this case, A and B. But we really have three alleles for blood type, don't we? A, B, and what's our third allele? O. So when you have three or more alleles, they often will call that a multi-allele system. And most of our physical traits, most of our genes, they're arranged that way. We have more than just two alleles for any particular gene. All right, so here we've got two parents. And this is the blood type of mom and dad. I'm not sure if we, who is who here. So what we need to determine are what are going to be 
the blood type of our offspring. So here we have our two possible gametes we can have for each one of our parents. This can only be an A or a B, and what's this? It's got to be a what? It's got to be an O. One or the other, it's still going to be an O. So if you used our Punit square method, what are the types of blood that are possible for any one of our offspring? Your kids are what are going to have either or what types of blood? Are we going to have any kids with AB blood? Are we going to have any kids with O blood? No. Because if you look at what's going on here, you're going to get an A from this parent or a B from this parent. You take this O and put it over here, or you're going to get an A or a B and take this O. What are the blood types of your kids? Either A or B. What's the chance of your child having A-type blood? 50%. What's the chance of your child being heterozygous? 100%. So that's, that's one way that you can find out. Knowing your type of blood and knowing your parent's type of blood, you can get a pretty good understanding of what your genotype for your blood is to then know what, what blood type should your children have. All right, so let's do this. Is this possible? Is it possible for two parents to have four children, each with different blood type? Or should we put these people on Jerry Springer? Right, Jerry Springer? You've seen that, right? Mm -hmm. Always going to be a fight. More sure to have a fight on Jerry Springer than going to a hockey game. You're going to have a fight. So now we're kind of working backwards, right? This, this would be like you and your brothers and sisters getting together and saying, okay, what blood type do we have? What, what are our genotypes? So when we look at these children, what, what information do we know already based on their phenotype, their blood type? What do we know about their genotype? Do we know the genotypes of any of these already? Yeah, I mean, AB is AB. It's both phenotype and genotype. What about, what about O? What's it got to be? Oh, okay, well, we're kind of going backwards. A and B. One parent's going to have to have A, and one parent's got to have to have B. O, they both got O, right? So that means we got an O from one and an O from the other. So if this child has A-type blood, what does their genotype have to be? A, O, and what about this one? B, O. So what you're doing is basically you are using segregation and independent assortment, those philosophies that Mendel laid down to help you determine the heredity of blood type and to understand what the genotype is for an individual when you only know the phenotype. Does that make sense? Now, in a multi-allele system, that's when we're talking about one gene. But many of our physical traits that are manifested are basically the physical manifestation of multiple genes working together. And when we look at this poly genic inheritance, and here we're showing eye color. Basically how you're going to recognize a polygenic type of inheritance is when you see a complete spectrum of eye color. Because when you look at individuals that have blue eyes, does everyone have the same blue for the blue eyes? Man, some people have those bright, I'm talking, have you seen people have this kind of blue eyes? You just, you kind of get hypnotized, right? It's like, how can your eyes be that blue? And I'm not talking contacts. I'm talking about the real thing. And then some people have those icy blue, almost gray eyes. So that is an example of what is referred to as continuous variation. When you look across the population, it's, it's going to look like a rainbow 
where, where the colors just kind of blend together and you can't see a clear demarcation between the distinct colors. And that's due because of multiple genes and the traits and the alleles of those multiple genes affecting the actual physical manifestation or the phenotype of that particular individual. So this is a cool quote. The more genes, and of course we can't, we can't discount environmental factors. We, we simply can't. How you were raised, what you were exposed to, different parts of the world, different climates, types of foods. But the greater the number of genes and with the impact of the environment, you can see more of this continuous distribution. And you can see the greater differences, or as they say, versions, I like to say flavors, of that particular trait. And eye color is a great example of how that polygenic inheritance illustrates all of those incredibly beautiful different eye colors among the people on our planet. But you know what's kind of cool? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of get on a soapbox here a little bit. When you look at those pictures, what, what are you looking at? What do you see? You look at those pictures, what are you looking at? Eyes. Why do we get so, as a society, why are we fixated on color? Well, you see the color, but how, how much of an impact is the color having on what that eye is doing? How much of an impact is that color having on that being or not being an eye? Are those eyeballs, other than the color, are those eyeballs the same? Yeah. So why do we, you see where I'm going, right? You see where I'm going? It's like skin color. Why, why do we get so distracted by skin color when we are way more the same than we are different? And what's the skin color really got to do with the cost of tea in China anyway? It doesn't. We're all the same. So don't get distracted by, now we can get distracted by that one, right? We already said, that's like crazy blue. But I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay. Moving along. Now in this one, this is pretty interesting. This is different students demonstrating this polygenic inheritance in this spectrum across different traits. And what these students actually did was they looked at their height. And when you look at height and you look at the number of individuals that might be shorter versus the number of individuals that might be taller, what, what do you typically, what do you see there? What do we call that? We usually think about this only when we think of grades. What's that, what is that? A bell-shaped curve that is a normal distribution across the population. And you're going to find way more people that are average. We hate being called average, don't we? But there are way more people that are going to fall into an average reign that are going to be at either extreme. And again, just the variation of population when you're talking about polygenic inheritance. If you could do eye color on a spectrum on a graph, it would look the same way. You'd have that distribution with most falling in the middle. So what the picture was illustrating here, you can see essentially a graphical representation of that same data. And honestly, when you look at grades on exams, that's pretty much what you expect to see. Now, if everybody in the class got a hundreds, man, I'd record those hundreds. But when you give tests to hundreds of students, just again, normal population, you're going to get something that looks about like this. It's always kind of surprising when it happens, but it always does. All right, we've already talked about sex determination, so we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about it. But here we got mom. Here we got dad. What's the only chromosome you're going to get from mom? An X. What chromosomes can you get from dad? So who decides if you're a boy or a girl? Dad, dad. Dad's going to decide. And again, what are the chances of having a boy or a girl? 50-50 shot. You're flipping a coin every time you make a baby. 50-50 shot. 
And that's really, I mean, that's sex determination. It is just that straightforward. Now, if you go to a fertility clinic and they can separate those out, then that's completely different. But naturally speaking, you've got a 50-50 shot from a chromosome standpoint. I told you the Y chromosome was small, right? Only 24 genes. Ladies, you carry the load, right? Almost a hundred times more genes on the X chromosome than you find on the Y chromosome. And again, this speaks to the fact that the X chromosome, that default pathway for gender, is female. All these 24 genes do is turn a bunch of those off, and the others turn on the male genes to form a male of the species. Now, Colorblind, remember, where, where did we say the gene was for colorblind? It was on the X chromosome. So that means the colorblind gene can also be referred to as X-linked. See what I just did? We talked about the linkage and we linked colorblindness to the X chromosome. So anytime you talk about a gene or a mutation or a disease that is on a specific chromosome, and therefore its inheritance can be predicted, we say that is a linked gene. So you might talk about colorblindness being sex-linked or X-linked because we know exactly where it is on the X chromosome. So X-linked or sex-linked. If you say sex-linked, it could be the X or the Y. So stipulating X-linked is a little bit more specific as we're trying to describe what's going on with the inheritance. I'm trying to think of some Y-linked genes. I think there's some hemophilia genes that are Y-linked. I'm, I'm not gonna bet money on that, but I think some hemophilia genes are Y-linked. Now stuff doesn't always go right. Can we all agree? Stuff doesn't go right. And we can have genetic abnormalities. Now, we're not talking about, about cancer here. That's going to be in our last chapter. That's from a mutation after you're grown. Here we're talking about problems from the very beginning. You inherited something that was wrong. And so that is a genetic disorder. Now, it's an inherited condition, maybe life-threatening. The abnormality, that doesn't sound nearly as bad because it's not. It's just a rare version of a gene not typically life-threatening. And you hear syndrome a lot too, right? What, what word typically do you think of before syndrome? Down syndrome. This is going to be a set of symptoms for a particular disorder. Now with Down syndrome, and I can't remember if we have more, more slides about this, but you know, you've got the epicanthal folds on the inside of the eye, which makes them look a little bit Asian because uh, some people in Asia also have that fold of skin on the inside of the eye here. They have protruding tongues because their mouth is small. Their tongue is normal size, their mouth is small. Have you ever seen individual with Down syndrome walk around with a... And you think, oh, well, they're just being silly. See, no, their tongue doesn't fit in their mouth. And it, they have to retract the tongue, and it's uncomfortable to hold the tongue in that position. Another instance, another symptom of Down syndrome, look at the folds of your palm. Do you see how you have the line coming from your thumb and your index finger going across? And on the opposite side, you have a line that comes across and sometimes curves upward. If both of those lines connect and go straight across, that's referred to as a simian crease. And those occur at a very high incidence in those with Down syndrome. Now, if you have that, don't think I've got Down syndrome. Oh, my God. I had, I had a student in class that was like, ah, just freaked out because that it went, oh, it wasn't really, but it kind of looked like it did. But you could tell that they did not have Down syndrome. All right. So all those symptoms together make up that syndrome. Autosomal recessive. What is, what is an autosome? Remember what we said an autosome was? Chromosome 1 through 22. Those are our autosomes. 
Anything but sex chromosomes are the autosomes. So with an autosomal recessive, this is going to follow our normal dominant versus recessive Mendelian genetics. So we say a mother, and when we say carrier, does everyone understand what we mean by carrier? So in this case, what is, what's the genotype of this mom? How would you describe that? Heterozygous, one dominant and one recessive. And if this recessive is a disorder like colorblindness, okay, would mom be colorblind? No. Now, it, it, of course, it's a different situation here because we're, we're not just talking about on the X chromosome. But if this if recessive is colorblind, would dad be colorblind? No. But do you see how they have the colorblind allele? If you carry the allele for something but don't physically express it, that means you're a carrier. So in this case, if we have two carriers and they have children, what's the percent chance that one of their children are going to physically express the trait? 25% because it's only going to be this, heter this homozygous recessive. That's the only time that that's going to be expressed. Now, with these, is anyone tempted to call that heterozygous dominant? In a dominant recessive situation, if you say heterozygous, it's understood one dominant, one recessive, so you don't have to say anything after that. But this is going to be homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive, and only that 25% chance is going to cause that child to physically manifest that disorder. So let's look at this situation. Now we're autosomal dominant. So we have a mom, normal, right? What's her genotype? Recessive. What kind of recessive? Homozygous recessive. Dad, heterozygous. Is dad affected? Yes, because remember this is dominant. It only takes one. If you have a heterozygous affected parent, and you got a homozygous recessive non-affected parent, what are the chances of having a child that expresses this trait? 50%. 50%. And the other 50% are going to be normal. What if dad was homozygous dominant for this trait? How many children would have it? All of them. All of the children would have it, even though mom is homozygous recessive. Do you see how powerful that little Punit square thing is? Very visual, very easy to move those alleles around to determine what's the percent chance of children having a certain trait. So an example of our autosomal dominant is dwarfism. And the classic type of dwarfism that we see in the United States and largely around the world is a type that's called achondroplasia. Dr. Uh, Arnold and her husband Bill neither have this type of dwarfism. Theirs is the result of a mutation. It is a random chance mutation. It's got some big fancy name. It's SED, spondyl epiphyseal dysplasia. SED is just easier, right? And it just occurred just by random chance. Neither one of their parents had anything even related to it. Just when they made either the sperm or the egg, you got that mutation and resulted in that disorder. Oh. His mom is a little person, and then her dad, it's like genetic. And exactly, it's because it's autosomal dominant. Um, if you've been into the advising center, Laura Turner, one of our advisors, she has achondroplasia, and she has a son who has achondroplasia. So, again, it is an autosomal dominant, and so it, that, that type can be inherited. If Bill and Dr. Arnold had been able to have a child, then that child could have potentially been normal. So X-linked recessive, I, you know, we got this one already. Uh, colorblind is a great example of that. So with colorblindness, in this case, we've got mom. And in this particular case, what they've tried to show is uh, the, the red X. wish they'd have made it a little one. But the red X, that's going to be the recessive, and the black is the dominant. Dad is, is normal vision. 
And so uh, here we have a daughter that has normal vision. Here we have a son that's normal vision. Here we have a daughter that's a carrier. Are they colorblind? No, because they have that dominant. But then we've got Junior back here. Unfortunately, 25% chance and boom, got the colorblind gene. So your dad's not colorblind or you don't know? You know, if you don't know, probably not. So this is probably exactly your case. Yeah, so, so I, I would bet that you're that unlucky 25%. So colorblindness, that particular trait. Oh, hemophilia, I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking hemophilia was Y-linked, but hemophilia is another one of our X-linked. Oh, you know why I was thinking it was Y-linked? Because it affects mostly males, or at a great higher rate than males, but it is, in fact, X-linked. So not only can we mess up individual genes, but we can also mess up the segregation of our chromosomes. Because how many pairs of chromosomes do we have? 23 pairs, 22 autosomes, one set of sex chromosomes. But in a case where you might have one too many or one too few chromosomes, that's called aneuploidy. Euploidy, the prefix EU means good. Ploidy, I guess, this, in this case, is the number of chromosomes. And anytime you see A or AN in front of the word, it means not or without. So in this case, this means without the good number of chromosomes. So either one up or one down. And we refer to that as aneuploid. Now, if you do have, instead of a pair, if you have a triplet, of each chromosome, you call that polyploid. And if you have a triplet of each chromosome, that is not compatible with life. You're not a superhuman, you're just not even here. Because that fertilized egg is not going to develop very long at all. Yes, ma'am? So is this referring to the intersexes? Sorry? Is this referring to intersexes, like when you don't have like XXY or? Now that is one case. but. When, when could aneuploid also apply? So you're talking about a situation where you have one too many or one missing sex chromosome. Do you know of a condition where you have one too many of an autosome? Down syndrome, which is also called what? Trisomy 21. Trisomy 21, you've got three copies of chromosome 21. And the reason it happens is because of what you see right here. Do you remember in... Um, mitosis and meiosis metaphase, where are the chromosomes and homologous chromosomes lined up in metaphase? Starts with an M, the middle at the equator. That's metaphase, that's when you recognize it. How do you know when you go to the next phase, which is anaphase? When they separate, when they move apart. In some of those cells, those sister chromatids don't pull apart. And so now you've got two copies going to one daughter cell and nothing going to the other. So you're going to end up with a daughter cell with one extra and a daughter cell with one missing. You see how that works with a non-disjunction? That's all because the spindle apparatus doesn't form right. And you end up with a case, and here's our illustration. See, we're supposed to pull these... And this is our homologous chromosome that's showing this non-disjunction in this case. In this, our non-disjunction didn't happen for this, this light blue chromosome pair here. So instead of going down, boom, you got all those going up. So now we end up in this particular illustration. We've got two sets of our gametes that have one extra. And here we have two gametes that have one missing. And if these are then used to fertilize the egg, or if these are the eggs and a sperm fertilizes, now you've got an aneuploid. One too many or one too few chromosomes. And there's our Down syndrome baby. We have a normal baby on the left, Down syndrome baby. Do you, do you see how this eyelid, how it's kind of got that crease over here? That's going to be the uh, epicanthal fold. 
We talked about the protruding tongue. Typically, the bridge of the nose right here is going to be flattened. And then there's that crease across your hand, the simian crease. Those are just some of the symptoms that we have with Down syndrome. Now, we've seen people with Down syndrome, right? We see how, how devastating it is, how um, limited they are in their educational capacity or intellectual capacity. Even shorter in stature, they're, they're usually not as tall. What gene is mutated in Down syndrome? That's a trick question. What gene is mutated in Down syndrome that leads to all these problems? None. There is no mutation. That extra chromosome 21 they got is perfectly normal. The results of what you're seeing is just having too much of good stuff. And, and I, I can't wrap my brain around how that works to lead to such debilitating physical and mental problems just because you have one extra copy. To me, it just says it's too much stuff. It's packed. Stuff's getting in the way and things don't work right. But that's how delicate the balance is when we talk about fertilization and having a baby. And do you also realize that the number of live births of Down syndrome is relatively small compared to the number of fertilized eggs that have trisomy 21? Most of those spontaneously abort because they don't develop. So I'm like, man, how often does it occurs quite often. And in fact, what is a risk factor for having a baby with Down syndrome? There's, there's something that as this increases, so does the chance of having a baby with Down syndrome. Maternal age. The older the female, the higher the chance of having a baby with, with Down syndrome. Now there's actually some evidence showing that paternal age affects it, but not as drastically as maternal age. So that's some of the risk factors. Oh, there we go. Okay. And there's the maternal. <laughs> I got ahead of myself. I forgot those slides were there. I'll just give you all a chance to, to write those down. It's, it's just it's incredible to me how often that occurs, though. So think about the numbers of people with Down syndrome that we have just living as normal lives as they can, but that represents a very small fraction. 75% spontaneously born, 20% of those that are born are stillborn. This, again, I think this is what you were referring to about the change in the sex chromosome number. If you're missing one of the X chromosomes, then you have Turner syndrome. Now, again, like Down syndrome, you, you don't see a lot of these make it to birth and live. But if they are, many of these are going to be relatively normal. Why would you think an XO individual or an X blank individual would be relatively normal? Because the X chromosome is the default pathway for gender development. Plus, in females, only one X chromosome is active. The other X chromosome, ladies, in your cells is inactive. It's a polar body. You only got one doing anything in the first place. But even though relatively normal, typically short in stature, and if you're short, don't think you've got Turner syndrome. Don't freak out. But many of these individuals are going to be infertile, and I'm not sure we really understand that uh, quite as well. Po possibly. Possibly. Estrogen, progesterone, some of the female hormones. Now, Kleinfelter is going to be a case where you have XXY. Now, they are considered male. Why are they considered male? You've got the Y chromosome. But much like we see in Turner, they're going to be infertile. But they're going to appear relatively normal. Now, XYY, some of these considered these super males, taller, but it was once thought that these individuals having the two Y chromosomes have more testosterone, more aggressive, and so you'd probably find this more in criminals. So a study went to penal institutions and took samples from all of these really, really serious criminals, and guess what the distribution of this was? Not significant. There was no correlation between the percent of criminals in prisons 
with this syndrome versus a normal population. So there's no correlation between having an extra Y chromosome and being more violent or more aggressive.